Whenever people try to admire the living world around them, they think about the often delicate balance of producers and consumers or predator and prey among the interconnected array of relationships, whether symbiotic or codependent, and we typically think of these as copacetic on the whole, despite the obvious struggle of death and survival. We often remark how each species is so perfectly suited to the role it plays in its environment, but since most folks don't know anything about the fossil record and are only aware of the generation that is alive today, they can't really appreciate how these organisms got that way. Nor do they realize that while we have tigers and grazing herds and burrowing moles today, they were very different species that were just as well adapted to play those same roles in a succession of previous ecosystems spanning tens of millions of years each. And no species is really perfect either. Some are better adapted than others, and any one of them could be improved by deliberately designed enhancements, but that is apparently, or evidently, not an option. Natural selection is a form of incidental design, playing on both sides of the arm race. As hunters become faster to chase quicker quarry, or an increase in poisonous potency demands an increase in chemical resistance or tolerance, a better disguise to fool sharper eyes, or tougher defenses against better weapons, and so on, and vice versa in each case, of course, as if each lineage has its own competing designers. Every animal on Earth is born with certain specs and has to learn as they go. On the population level, many species unwittingly experiment through trial and error, with many different strategies being employed at once by organisms that are clearly not planning their next moves. They're not even aware of the evolutionary experiment. They're just unintentionally adapting to their circumstances, and not always successfully. Otherwise, more than 99% of all animal species wouldn't already be extinct. As we followed the evolution of vertebrates, we've seen the earliest of them essentially learning how to swim, or at least improving on prior abilities, with tiny alterations once in a great while, which occasionally, eventually enhance their aptitude somewhat. We watched them learn how to walk in much the same way, with the earliest tetrapods being barely capable, and subsequent species being better suited than their forerunners, but still inadequate compared to their successors. And we see the same evident progression once the first vertebrates began to fly starting by jumping and gliding and moving into powered flight. Before there were birds, there were pterosaurs. The first pterosaurs were clumsy, inefficient, and like so many of us, had to work too hard to get not very far, struggling to stay above trouble and keep from crashing. An example of this is the earliest known pterosaur, Dimorphodon. The later rhamphorhynchoids got better at it, becoming more adept at guiding themselves through the air to target their prey in mid-flight. At this point in the series, we're in the upper middle Jurassic. At this time, a new line of pterosaurs changed the design. They weren't steering with their tails anymore, they were steering with their heads instead. And since their tails were no longer necessary, the next stage of their evolution was to shorten or lose those tails along with the associated membrane that tied their hind legs together. So that they weren't just better at flying, they were better at walking too. And these changes began a new line of pterosaurs called pterodactyloids. And these would become the biggest flying animals ever, with some as big as a man. And a couple of them were even as big as some airplanes and stood as tall as a giraffe. That's incredibly big for an animal that was still amazingly able to fly. Yet, despite their enormity, they were also the master flyers of all time, with super lightweight skeletons of hollow tubular bones and a suite of physical and neurological traits supremely adapted for flight. They could apparently fly much higher and faster than any bird, and some of them were even capable of transoceanic flights. Now think about when men first learned how to fly. Being the intelligent designers that we are, once we confirmed that flight was possible, we immediately explored every conceivable shape for aircraft, so that in only 30 years or so, we settled on the most optimum design that we're still using now, but which is very different from what we started with. But the first pterodactyls took to the air 30 million years after the first rhamphorhynchoids. So the blind design of natural selection working on myriad minuscule incidental mutations in population mechanics amid environmental dynamics obviously takes several orders of magnitude longer to accidentally try out a design that happens to work better than when someone who knows what they're doing is deliberately planning something. But evolution is not about getting bigger and better. It's not always improving or increasing complexity. It's about biodiversity. And as with every other major clade we've looked at, there were many more species in the pterosaur collective than most folks would ever guess, with many different versions suited to diverse diets and lifestyles, just like birds are today. And that's why pterodactyloids include the biggest, but also some of the smallest pterosaurs ever. 
Our ancestors at that time didn't just have to worry about being eaten by dinosaurs against whom no mammal could compete. Now we could be picked off from the air by pterosaurs as well. We've seen a few different species growing these oversized membranes and then learning to glide. And at this time, there were even a few dinosaurs doing that. While there were no actual birds yet, there were a few small manoraptors called paraaves because they were almost, but not quite, birds. And they had feathers, but hadn't yet figured out how to fly or even glide with them. So one lineage, called Scansoriopterygids, developed small two-fingered wings, like something between the wings of bats and those of pterosaurs. Now, they had feathers, too, but they didn't use them in their wings. Instead, they used them in their tails. So these weird little batodactyls were like the flying squirrels of tiny dinosaurs. And at that time, they were also gliding mammals, too. Myopatagium looked a bit like a flying squirrel, and Velaticotherium looked a lot like a colugo. And colugos are modern mammals that also look like proto-bats that never completed the evolution to powered flight. The membrane stretching from their arms to their legs also connected their fingers, too. So if Velaticotherium had survived into modern times, they might have developed actual four-fingered wings, just like bats have today. And despite this resemblance, though, Velaticotherium is not related to colugos, nor to bats, either. Velaticotherium was a triconodont, and Myopatagium was an allothere. Both of these clades died out millions of years ago with no descendants. In the last episode, we talked about our ancestry in Zatharia. Among Zatharian subsets is Tribosphenida, and this group is named for their cheek teeth, because of their shape at that time, but also because of their sequential placement in terms of evolutionary development from at least Holotheria through Theria. At this point in our series, we're getting very close to the split between marsupials and placental mammals, and we know a couple changes that have to be in place by now, but that we wouldn't likely ever find in fossils. Even in the rare case of complete skeletons, there are certain anatomical features we expect to see that are made of soft tissue and won't fossilize except in the rarest of pristine conditions. And the feature we're looking for now would be hard to identify even then because it is tucked so deep between the hind legs. And let me explain. When my kids were young, we had a pet emu living in our backyard. I loved that bird. His is the most famous photo ever of an emu, and it was taken in the park down the street from our house. We took this photo that same day. Anyway, like all birds, emus have a cloaca, meaning that the urinary tract and the colon are both the same thing. So he didn't pee and he didn't poop really either. Instead, we called it poos when he squirted out this runny, globby, icky, poop, piss combination. Now, birds and other reptiles lay eggs out of their cloaca because the anus and the vagina are the same orifice too. We can't be sure at exactly what stage our ancestors stopped laying eggs, but we know that marsupials and placental mammals don't lay eggs. They both give birth live. So their common ancestor must have two. And there are obvious health reasons why a fetus should not be literally pooped out through a sewer chute full of feces. So we use the phylogenetic bracket hypothesis to conclude that by this time, within Tribus finita, there should have been a separation of the ancestral cloaca, like reptiles and monotremes have, to separate the vagina and the anus into two different channels, just as any intelligent designer would have made them to start with. Well, actually, we would have designed a much better system altogether. Regardless, even if we disregard the subtle but diagnostic features in our cheek teeth, if you're capable of going number one separately from number two, and you don't always have to do both together at the same time, out of the same hole that your kids come out of, that you came out of, then aren't you happy that you were born Tribus Phenedon?